In 1959, John Freeman's guest on Face to Face was the outstanding mathematician and philosopher Bertrand Russell, then within two months of his 87th birthday. But far from being a frail old gentleman, he appeared before the camera as spry, mischievous and articulate as the public had ever known him throughout a long career as a campaigner in various causes at odds with the establishment. But it was from the establishment he came, grandson of two lords, one of them Lord John Russell, the Liberal Prime Minister. He went to Cambridge in 1890 where he wrote The Principles of Mathematics and later his great work Principia Mathematica. His academic work as one of the greatest philosophers of his day continued at Cambridge until the First World War, when his vigorous campaigning as a pacifist got him expelled from Trinity. But he continued as a writer, his history of Western philosophy published in 1945 gaining him a more popular acceptance and lasting financial security. Russell, a late Victorian, was an early crusader for free love, in revolt against the humbug and hypocrisy of much of Edwardian life, a freedom exemplified unashamedly in his own private life. After teaching in America, he returned to Britain in triumph after World War II, was given the Order of Merit in 1949, and won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1950. From the 50s onwards, his main concern was the threat of nuclear annihilation. He was the first president of the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament at the time of the face-to-face -face interview. And two years later, still battling against authority, he was arrested at an anti-nuclear sit-in in Parliament Square and sentenced to seven days in jail. He was 89 years old. His face-to-face -face interview reveals the qualities that sustained his reputation for decades. Lucidity of mind, transparent honesty and an endearing sense of fun. By the death of the third Earl Russell, or Bertrand Russell as he preferred to call himself, at the age of 90, a link with a very distant past is severed. His grandfather, Lord John Russell, the Victorian Prime Minister, visited Napoleon in Elba. His maternal grandmother was a friend of the young pretender's widow. In his youth, he did work of importance in mathematical logic. But his eccentric attitude during the First World War having escaped to a neutral country just before its outbreak. In private conversation, he was wont to say that homicidal lunatics were well employed in killing each other, but that sensible men would keep out of their way while they were doing it. He appeared in extreme old age, full of enjoyment, no doubt owing in large measure to his invariable health, for politically during his last years he was as isolated as Milton after the Restoration. He was the last survivor of a dead epoch. That uh, I wrote in 1937, a year before the Second World War began, as a prophesy of what I thought that the Times would say about me when I died. I observe that uh, the date I attributed to my death is uh, 1962 which is coming ominously near and begins to cause me some alarm. So before you feel too much alarm, let us examine this obituary which was written in jest and see how true it really is. To start with, let's go back to the distant past. What is your very earliest memory, Lord Russell? Well, uh, I suppose my very earliest memory is tumbling out of a pony carriage when I was two years old. And uh, my... Uh, uh, earliest at all vivid memories are of arriving at the house of my grandparents, Pembroke Lodge in Richmond Park, 
after the death of my father, who died when I was three. How did you come to be uh, in the care of your grandparents? Your mother had also died? Yes, she also. She died when I was two and my father when I was three. So do, you, was, do you have any memory of your parents? Uh, very little. I remember nothing of my mother. I remember my father once giving me a leaflet printed in red letters, and the red letters pleased me. What was life like at Pembroke Lodge? Did your grandparents, for instance, entertain the great people of the day? Uh, yes, not very much. My grandfather was already uh, an invalid. He could only get about in a bath chair. He died when I was six. My uh, grandmother survived for a long time till after I was married, but uh, she lived in semi-retirement. We saw a lot of distinguished people, especially literary people. Your grandfather had been a politician in his day, as your father? My grandfather, yes. My grandfather was twice prime minister. My father was in parliament for a very brief period. Did you meet the great and famous who used to come to visit, or were you shut away in the nursery? Oh, I used to meet them, yes. Who especially I, impressed you at that age? Well, I think Mr. Gladstone especially impressed me. Well, what's your memory of him? Oh, I have a great many memories of Mr. Gladstone. He had a, an eye that could quell anybody. It was, uh, people who didn't know him can't quite understand his political importance. It depended on his hawk's eye. My most uh, painful recollection of him is when I was 17 and very, very shy, and he came to stay with my people, and I was the only male in the family, and after the ladies had retired after dinner, I was left tete-a-tete -tete with Mr. Gadsden, and uh, he didn't do anything to alleviate my shyness. He made only one remark. He said, this is very good port they've given me, but why have they given it me in a claret glass? and I didn't know the answer. <laughs> Turning to your occupations as a child, what were the first books that impressed you? For instance, were you interested in history, in fairy stories, in adventure, or what? Oh, I was always very much interested in history, very much. In fairy stories when I was younger, yes. And uh, I regret to say that I liked Hans Anderson much better than Grimm. I don't now, but I did then, very much better. I read Hans Andersen's fairy tales over and over again when I was young. Were you always a skeptic uh, from small childhood, or did you believe in the conventions? Oh, of I idea? wasn't a skeptic when I was very young, no. I was very deeply religious and uh, lost my conventional beliefs slowly and painfully. Very slowly, I remember it now. This is another very early memory that I have, that when I was four years old, They'd just been telling me the story of uh, Little Red Riding Hood. And I dreamt that I'd been eaten by a wolf. And to my great surprise, I was in the wolf's stomach and not in heaven. <laughs> this was the beginning, perhaps, of skepticism. <laughs> yes. Um, tell me, did you say your prayers when you were a child? Oh, yes. When did you cease doing that? Oh, I suppose when I was about 12 or 13. Were you made to say them before that? Uh, well, yes, I was made to at first, but I went on after I'd stopped being made to. Yes. Will you tell me what experience it was that gave you your first intuition about scepticism when you were a child? <laughs> well, I suppose you might say the uh, time when I tried to catch an angel. They told me when I was an infant that angels watched around my bed while I slept. And I'd seen pictures of angels, and I thought I should very much like to see one. But I supposed that uh, the moment I opened my eyes, they fled away. So I thought, well, next time I wake up, I won't open my eyes, and they won't know. And I did so, and I made a grab, thinking I should catch an angel, but I didn't. Do you think now, looking back, that there's any really unfortunate legacy that you carried out of your childhood? I do. I mean... The sort of family attitude, certainly on, on matters of sex, was morbid, morbidly puritanical. Well, did you then, in fact, have a feeling of guilt about sex? No, well, I don't know. Not, I don't think I had much occasion to, no. 
Well, now, let's turn to your schooling. What sort of learning at that age? Did you, for instance, study the classics? Uh, well, to a certain degree, I was never fond of the classics. I mean, mathematics was what I liked. My first lesson in mathematics I had from my brother, who started me on Euclid. And I thought it was the most lovely stuff I'd ever seen in my life. I didn't know there was anything so nice in the world. Can you remember and tell us about that first Oh, lesson? yes, I remember it very well. But uh, I remember that it was a disappointment because he said, now we start with axioms. And I said, what are they? And he said, oh, they're things you've got to admit, although we can't prove them. So I said, why should I admit them if you can't prove them? And he said, well, if you won't, we can't go on. And I wanted to see how it went on, so I admitted them pro tem. Now, what was it that first uh, provided you with the incentive to become a mathematician? I liked it, well, for a number of reasons. In the first place, the sheer pleasure, which is the sort that people get from music or from poetry, just it, it, it delighted me. And then, apart from that, I thought that uh, mathematics was the key to understanding the universe. And uh, I found all sorts of everyday things explained by means of mathematics. Have you found on the whole in your own life that the pursuit of either mathematics or philosophy has given you a, some sort of substitute for religious emotion? Yes, it uh, certainly did. I mean, uh, oh, well, until I was about 40, I should think, I got uh, the sort of satisfaction that Plato says you can get out of mathematics. It was an eternal world, it was a timeless world. It was a world where there was a possibility of a certain kind of perfection. And uh, I certainly got uh, something analogous to religious satisfaction out of it. Um, what uh, period of your life, or rather what episode in your life, led you to turn again from philosophy, to some extent, into social work and politics? Oh, the First War. The First War made me think it, it just won't do to live in an ivory tower. This world is too bad, we must notice it. Were you a moral pacifist, or was it merely that the war seemed to you to be inexpedient and unnecessary? I thought, as a politician, and I still think, that it would have been very much better for the world if Britain had remained neutral and the Germans had won a quick victory. We should not have had either the Nazis or the Communists if that had happened. Because they, they were both products of the First World War. The war would have been brief, there would have been nothing like so much destruction. I still think that that is valid, that is speaking as a politician. Uh, speaking as a human being, I used to have occasion to go to Waterloo and there I would see troop trains going off, filled with uh, young men who were almost sure to be slaughtered. And I, I couldn't bear it. It was too horrible. How much, in fact, did you actively campaign against it? Oh, as much as I could. I went all over the place making speeches. And uh, I did everything I could to help the conscientious objectors. I wrote about it everywhere where I could. No, I did everything I could think of to do. Uh, did you have a uh, sort of public notoriety as an unpopular figure, or were you regarded as just a, a, a crank? I wasn't actually pelted with rotten eggs, but I had an almost worse experience. I was uh, at a meeting of pacifists at the Circuit Brotherhood Church, and uh, it was stormed by a mixture of colonial troops and uh, drunken viragos. The drunken viragos came in bearing boards full of rusty nails with which they tamped everybody on the head. And the uh, colonial soldiers looked on and applauded them. And the police looked on and did nothing. And uh, women had all their clothes torn off their backs and were badly mauled and so forth and so on. And uh, the Viragos and the rusty nails were just about to attack me and I didn't quite know what one did about this. When uh, somebody went up to the police and said, look, you really ought to stop these women, you know, he's a distinguished writer. Oh, said the police. Yes, he's a well-known philosopher. Oh, said the police. 
he said, brother, I know. And then the police rushed and saved me. <laughs> was this the time that you went to prison, or was that... No, no, that was, no, it was uh, earlier. Uh, well, what exactly did you go to prison for? For writing an article which uh, I was convicted uh, on the ground that this article was intended and likely to cause bad relations between England and the United States because uh, I pointed out how United States troops were used as strike breakers and I just thought I oughtn't to have done that. Did you plead guilty to the charge? Oh no, oh no, no I didn't. I said it's nonsense. If you really think that uh, the United States is going to alter its policy because of an obscure article in a little sheet that nobody reads. <laughs> uh, were you tried by a jury or by a magistrate? By a magistrate. In London? In London. And he said this was the most despicable crime. Yeah. <laughs> and what did he sentence you to? He sentenced me to six months. And originally it was six months uh, as an ordinary criminal. And then on appeal it was altered to six months in the first division. Which meant more lenient treatment. Oh, very much. It's a profound difference. Now, I have heard it said that at that stage your family were able to pull strings, which led, gave you treatment quite different even from that of normal First Division prisoners. Is that true? I should think it's very likely. My brother knew everybody concerned. And uh, uh, when the uh, uh, Home Secretary wasn't being very obliging. My brother went and see him. Oh, he was my fag at Winchester. So he did. Now, at the time of your own trial and imprisonment, do you think, looking back, that Trinity College behaved either wisely or justly in depriving you of your fellowship? No, certainly not. Especially as they did it while the case was subdued, you see. All the younger fellows had gone to the war and uh, the government of the college was left to the old boys and the old boys felt we must do our bit we can't fight we're too old and their bit was to get rid of me <laughs> now something very similar to that of course happened in the second world war when your appointment at the college of the city of new york was terminated what actually did happen in the second world war oh in the second world war i was completely patriotic i uh, supported the war and uh, i was uh, entirely orthodox in my views about that Nevertheless, you were thrown out of another college at the same age. Ah, but that was for quite different reasons. Uh, that was uh, on the ground of my views about marriage and morals. Uh, that was a, a Roman Catholic business. Uh, there was a woman who was intending to send her daughter uh, to the college the city of New York where her daughter was not going to study mathematical logic, which was the subject I was going to teach. But nevertheless, this woman professed to be afraid that I should rape her daughter or corrupt her in some way by my mere presence in other classrooms in the same university. And uh, on that ground, she brought an action that I should be deprived of my position. And uh, she accused me of being the youth, lecherous, lascivious, obscene, and aphrodisiac. And all these charges were upheld by the judge in the court, and the judge said that he would therefore annul this appointment. And did she bring any evidence to justify these charges? Yes, oh yes. It was proved that I had said that uh, an infant under six months old, if seen touching his parts, should not be slapped. Uh, that was the chief evidence. But what happened to you when you lost your job in New York? Were you, for instance, did you have another job to go to in America? Well, I didn't know I should have. I was completely ostracized. Uh, no newspaper would print a word I wrote. No magazine would print a word. No uh, hall would allow me to lecture in it so that I was cut off from all my means of livelihood and uh, I couldn't get any money out of England at that time because of currency regulations and uh, so I was expecting to starve. I had uh, three children whom I was educating, two of them at the university, one younger, and uh, I expected we should all suffer very badly and we should have done but for a certain man called Dr. Barnes 
who came to my rescue and gave me a job. As a result of that alarming experience, have you felt any permanent resentment against the Americans? Oh, no, none whatever. I think, uh, after all, my father, when he stood for Parliament in a rural constituency in 1868, uh, suffered in exactly the same way, for exactly the same causes. And uh, I allowed myself to reflect that uh, urban New York in 1940 was exactly at the same point in the road towards enlightenment as rural England in 1868. But having made that remark, I felt no further resentment. Do you ever now, in old age, encounter these explosions of anger? Oh, yes. I had a letter from an Anglican bishop not long ago, in which he said that uh, all my opinions on everything were inspired by sexual lust, and that uh, the opinions I'd expressed on this subject were among the causes of the Second World War. Do you think that on the whole the fanatics in the world are more useful or more dangerous than the skeptics? Fanaticism is the danger of the world and always has been and has done untold harm. No, I think fanaticism is the gravest danger there is. I might almost say that I was fanatical against fanaticism. But then are you not fanatical <laughs> also against some other things? You see, now, your, your current uh, uh, campaign, for instance, in favor of nuclear disarmament, I, I, w w would you encourage your supporters to undertake some of the extreme demonstrations that they undertake? And isn't that fanaticism? I don't think that's fanaticism, no. I mean, uh, some of them may be fanatical, but... Uh, I do give them support, but not from fanatical reasons. I support them because everything sane and sensible and quiet that we do is absolutely ignored by the press. And the only way we can get into the press is to do something that looks fanatical. Do you think it possible that the anti-nuclear campaign may already be a bit out of date in the light of the preparations for bacteriological and biological warfare which we now know are going on? It certainly would be if it was only a campaign against nuclear weapons. But it is in fact a campaign against war. And the momentary argument against war is mainly derived from nuclear weapons. But if they were out of the way, there would be other arguments that would be just as potent. And uh, the fact is that scientific man cannot survive if he is going to continue to make war. I mean, uh, the, the worst possibility is that human life may be extinguished, and it is a very real possibility, very real. And uh, that is the worst. But uh, assuming that doesn't happen, I uh, can't uh, bear the thought of uh, many hundreds of millions of people dying in agony only and solely because the rulers of the world are stupid and wicked, and I can't bear it. Do you look back to the 19th century on the whole with nostalgia and regret? Well, it all depends upon what you're thinking about. Uh, the world is much more beautiful to look at than it is now. Every time I go back to a place that I knew long ago, I think, oh, how sad it is. This place used to be beautiful and now it's hideous. And uh, one thing after another, one piece of beauty after another is destroyed. And that I do profoundly regret. But uh, when it comes to ideas, well, there's immensely less humbug than there was, and that I rejoice in. Of the sort of conventional self-indulgences or vices like drink and tobacco and so on, which is your favorite one? Oh, tobacco. I smoke a pipe all day long except when I'm eating or sleeping. Hasn't that shortened your life? Well, they used to say it would when I first took to it, but uh, I took to it some 70 years ago, so it doesn't seem to have had a very great effect so far. In fact, uh, you know, on one occasion it saved my life. I was uh, in uh, an airplane and uh, a man was getting a seat for me and I said, get me a seat in the smoking part. So if I can't smoke, I shall die. And sure enough, there was an accident, a bad accident, and all the people in the non-smoking part of the plane were drowned. 
and uh, the people in the smoking part jumped into the Norwegian fjord where we'd landed and were, sa were saved so that I owe my life to smoking. Did you have to swim to save your life? Oh yes, we all had to. And did you think great thoughts about death and survival when you were actually swimming? No, I was strung up by a journalist in Copenhagen and he said, uh, what did you think while you were swimming in the fjord? So I said, I thought the water was cold. And he said, did you not think about mysticism and logic? And I said, no, and rang off. Did all this happen a great many years ago? Not a great many years ago. I think it was about 1949, as far as I can remember. When you were in your late 70s? Yes. Have you, in your 87th year, any unfulfilled ambitions? Oh, well, of course, uh, there are all sorts of things I should like to have written and haven't written yet. I mean, uh, almost every day I think of some new subject I should like to have written a book about, uh, but there isn't time to write them all. Uh, have you written an autobiography? I have, yes. Is it up to date? Uh, well, no, not quite. Are you going to allow it to be published in your lifetime? No, no, not till I'm dead. Why? Well, in the first place, because it uh, won't be complete until then. And in the second place, because uh, there are all sorts of uh, things that ought not to be said too soon, and it may even have to wait some time after I'm dead, I don't know. One last question. Suppose, Lord Russell, this film were to be looked at by our descendants, like a Dead Sea Scroll in a thousand years' time. What would you think it's worth telling that generation about the life you've lived and the lessons you've learned from it? I should like to say two things. One intellectual and one moral. The intellectual thing I should want to say to them is this. When you are studying any matter or considering any philosophy, ask yourself only what are the facts and what is the truth that the facts bear out. Never let yourself be diverted either by what you would wish to believe or by what you think would have beneficent social effects if it were believed. But look only and solely at what are the facts. That is the intellectual thing that I should wish to say. The moral thing I should wish to say to them is very simple. I should say, love is wise, hatred is foolish. In this world, which is getting more and more closely interconnected, we have to learn to tolerate each other. We have to learn to put up with the fact that some people say things that we don't like. We can only live together in that way. And if we are to live together and not die together, we must learn a kind of charity and a kind of tolerance, which is absolutely vital to the continuation of human life on this planet.